No one really denies the importance of philosophy in the life of man. But in recent times, we have been brought to the unfortunate emergency of being forced to interpret a very large good word in a way entirely contrary to the original insight which was associated with the term. We think now of philosophy as some kind of a formal instrument of thinking, and that this instrument some way lies outside of ourselves. We study philosophy, but it does not necessarily follow that we practice it or gain any direct insight as a result of the learning we accumulate. Thus we may say that for the most part what passes for philosophy today is a history of philosophic thought in the past and variously documented biographical sketches of earlier philosophers. When you read a story of philosophy today, you read principally an account of persons, not of ideas. And these ideas that they do have are associated directly with these persons. So we think of the philosophy of Hegel, and we call it Hegelianism. Uh, we think of the philosophy of Thomas Aquinas, and call it Thomism. Thus we have schools of philosophy, so-called, that arise from the thoughts of men. Perhaps it would seem that there is no other place they can arise. But human beings are very strongly individualized. And when Immanuel Kant, uh, Kant gave his philosophy to the world, we associated it with his name. Of course, we cannot avoid this entirely. We think of Platonism, Pythagoreanism, Neoplatonism. These terms are always associated with persons. To a measure, we accept this. But actually, we are dealing with something that transcends persons. Plato and St. Thomas Aquinas were philosophers because of a certain capacity within themselves. They were not philosophers primarily because they were students of philosophy. They were brought to a high place in the intellectual life of the race by their own magnificent internal equipment. And through this equipment, something was released into manifestation. Today, in most lines of thinking, we believe in a more or less accumulative procedure, and medicine is an example of this. We no longer think of medicine primarily in the terms of doctors. And while medicine has its heroes, these are not the uh, heroes we think of when we think of healing. We think of healing as a great body of knowledge, not merely uh, a number of interesting individuals. Actually, the same is true of law. To the lawyer, there are many important legal personalities in the history of jurisprudence. But we think of law today as a great compound of knowledge uh, given to us over thousands of years by persons known and unknown, named and unnamed, remembered and forgotten. We also have realized that law, as far as legal procedure is concerned, is more or less the result of the unfoldment of an archetypal entity of ethics within man, and that so long as man is ethical, this law operates, and his laws are ethical. When man fails in ethics, the law fails in ethics. It cannot be otherwise. 
Thus through man, various truths come into manifestation, but these truths have an existence apart from man. And I think we should remember that philosophy is not something that is always captured by individuals, but that philosophy is some state or condition of the consciousness of living things, and that all creatures that have rational equipment at some time or other in the unfoldment of their natures pass through this phase which we call philosophical. We find that as maturity comes upon the individual in physical life, the certain changes come in his attitudes and his approach to life, that he begins to take on greater responsibilities, and that those interests which were sufficient for his childhood are no longer sufficient to dominate his activity. We do not think of maturity in terms merely of people who have grown up. We do not think of particularly of Platonic maturity or Aristotelian maturity. We think of people growing up everywhere, in every walk of life, in every condition of consciousness. And I believe that in the course of time we must learn to approach philosophy this way. That we will no longer think of it as a traditional body of opinion but we'll think about it as a living instrument available to each one of us. Truly, as in the case of most arts and sciences, we have to learn or study in order to become proficient in a form of knowledge. However, learning and study will not guarantee this proficiency. To all outside instruction, instruction must be added the internal factor of ability, or the individual must be recognized as having an aptitude for a kind of learning. It may well be that the musician will never have an aptitude for philosophy, or it may well be that an actor will never have an aptitude for law or medicine. But it is very definitely true that all human beings have a certain degree of aptitude in the use of their minds. And philosophy, therefore, is a method of culturing the minds and thoughts of men. I think we must outgrow the, the idea that philosophy divides into these schools and that we are only philosophical to the degree that we align ourselves with one of them. Just as today we may think ourselves religious because we belong to a certain church and doubt the religious integrity of another person because he belongs to a different church, today we have this same problem with philosophy. Uh, those who follow the Kantian school of philosophy look with great suspicion upon the followers of Leibniz or the followers of other systems. Uh, they hardly speak the same language. So when we are thinking of philosophy today, we are thinking mostly of these great dominant systems of European intellectualism which have dominated our way of life uh, for many centuries. We are thinking in terms of allegiances to doctrines, and philosophy has become a vast and complicated doctrine divided into innumerable sub-branches and divisions, these divisions being further divided and enriched by continuing contribution, so that even in this age in which philosophy is far from, from prevalent, we still have minor schools rising, uh, such as, for example, our friends the existentialists. They constitute a philosophic group are largely based in the philosophy of futility. This uh, building of these schools causes us to say that philosophy comes to the person who spends a certain number of years studying the thinking of a certain person or school of persons who have lived at some past time 
and who have evolved within themselves a doctrinal structure relating to life and have interpreted universal existence according to a formula. If we accept this formula, we belong to their school. If we do not accept this formula, we are not welcome in that particular environment. So philosophy again becomes a selectivity among various formulas. If we find a formula that is rather pleasing to us, it is like finding a pair of shoes that somewhat fits. In this we feel a great achievement, a great victory. We are not likely to question as to why our favorite might have been wrong, or nor are we inclined to wonder why he didn't study other systems which he never mentions, or he was thoroughly aware of some of the systems that he denounces or criticizes. We th somehow, therefore, come to think of this philosophy as an available mass of opinion or belief or conviction, not perhaps entirely amateurish, because it has passed through a series of processings uh, through able minds, and we have confidence in the philosophy because we have confidence in the ability of the thinker who gave us that particular system. It's all authority, it's all tradition. Now we are not attacking the validity of either of these, but I think it results in a situation that is not favorable for the development of a philosophic era. The first thing you have to have in modern, modern philosophy is an exceptionally good memory. If you are able to remember the essential elements of a system, you can probably gradually work up to a Ph.D. This remembering of a system does help in some respects, but it gives us the victory of having remembered and having finally received our diploma, proving and certifying that we have a good memory. We then promptly forget about the whole thing, unless by some chance we decide to be a professor of philosophy. Under such conditions we begin to teach that which we have learned, often adding nothing of ourselves but simply parroting the original text. We go on and on and on, repeating the same words like the family parrot, with not much certainty that we understand what they mean or have ever been able to vitalize them beyond the problem of tantalizing a classroom with difficult questions. This means that we go on through what we now call learning and can graduate with all honors and still have no dynamic within ourselves. Instead of philosophy creating within us a magnificent adventure, it ends up in a common boredom. Uh, if not worse, because if we start to study comparative philosophy, then we find that most of these intellects violently differed from each other, that many of them held utterly irreconcilable points of view, and that you can get into just as serious a dilemma trying to reconcile philosophic systems as you can trying to reconcile uh, political or religious systems. Instead of the end being knowledge and wisdom and insight, the end of the search is confusion. We then come to the natural problem of the doubter. When the great masters of a learning cannot agree, what shall the humble followers do? They stand by in amazement, watching their betters, as Voltaire says, throwing three-legged stools at each other's heads. There seems to be no reason why we should expect more comfort from a philosophy than its principal exponents, and as very few of them seem to have gained any comfort, we can doubt the wisdom of the entire proceeding. Uh, this leads, naturally, to a skepticism, 
And when we learn that dozens of the world's great thinkers have startlingly disagreed, then we wonder what we can believe, uh, what knowledge we can affirm. So that finally, as one uh, the Greeks observed long ago, that the end of philosophical meditation is simply a legitimate doubt about the validity of anything. Philosophy producing the great skepticism, the sudden realization that all knowledge may be futility. So looking back over this problem and realizing that it is one of the heritages which we bring down into modern times, it seems well to try to analyze it a little more closely. And we have a splendid parallel in religion, uh, which has been close to philosophy in many respects since the very beginning of time. Uh, we observe that in philosophy, as in religion, and more or less in science also, the tendency of the individual and of the school and of systems is to glorify points of difference. A system stands because it is isolated by its own ideas. A system has a reason to exist because it is different. The concept is if it was like other things, it would be dissolved or absorbed by other things. If uh, several different religious groups admitted their identity, they would have no longer any reason to struggle for their own existence. They could meld or mingle or merge, be one body, and the small, isolated struggle which makes meaning for many of these people would no longer be reasonable or profitable. The same is true in philosophy. It is assumed that these differences of opinion sharpen the wit, but more actually I think they dull it, because they give us no solid core of integration. Actually, religion and philosophy have this in common. The division can occur within them, but that substantially they cannot be divided, either within themselves or, for that matter, from each other. Thus, philosophy is an inclusive, within which all types of philosophic thought have a common existence. All philosophy springs from one over-concept. All philosophy unfolds according to certain obvious human phenomena. All philosophy has one practical use. All the differences and all the various divisions that arise within its schools simply represent a certain human competition. The fact that man seems to prefer to compete rather than to cooperate may play a part in this. Man believes that he is important to the degree that he is different. If the individual cannot be in some way unique, he is not an individual. And uh, for most people, difference of opinion is the only valid uniqueness that they can understand. So in philosophy, uh, schools exist simply because they differ. Without this difference, the great stream of philosophy would flow along. And many feel that under these conditions it would flow along without actually building any monuments to itself in the world. That actually these monuments stand as markers of the victory of ideas over other ideas whereas really they should stand uh, for the unity of ideas that have arisen uh, throughout the history of the world. Today we can no longer afford this luxury of endless argument and debate concerning something which most people today have concluded that nobody knows, and therefore that philosophy has become highly uh, passé in the popular thinking simply because the average person can find no use for it. He finds that there's absolutely no way in which he can go down to the grocery store and get a cut of meat cheaper because he quotes Aristotle. 
In fact, if he suspected of so much learning, they were probably to double the price on him. <laughs> or feel that he is so absent-minded they can cheat him and he'll never even know it. <laughs> There's an old Greek philosophy that said, uh, says in a play that was written long ago, the time for treason it is, is at hand. The gods sleep in philosophy. Now, for that basis, you can now go on and commit murder because they will not wake up in time to do anything about it. This kind of thinking has caused more or less uh, to the people to feel that certainly in a stressful, pressure-ridden economic industrial era, philosophy is just too much of a luxury. Uh, perhaps it is also a kind of a luxury that is also too much of a headache. And the combination is just too much. And uh, unless the person is planning a career as an educator in philosophy, he is very likely to neglect the subject. And he feels that he can neglect it with uh, impunity. It isn't going to mean anything to him one way or the other. The chances of his meeting a philosopher during his lifetime, very small, the chance of selling him anything, very much smaller. <laughs> Consequently, why specialize the field? This attitude probably had its best correction in Western thinking in the time of the Neoplatonists of Alexandria. Perhaps uh, among Western scholars, the Neoplatonists were among the first, certainly, and the strongest to point out that philosophy is not a doctrine at all. Philosophy is a way of conduct. Philosophy is a code of action. It has nothing to do with abstract speculation about infinities. True, a philosophy can speculate. But unless this speculation leads to vital motion, unless our thoughts impel us to do something, these thoughts are simply impotent. And philosophy has come to be regarded as impotent intellectualism. The philosopher, enriched by maybe eight or ten years of specialized schooling and study, stands like the common man in a daze in the presence of emergency. It hasn't touched him. It hasn't given him this inner strength with which to create a useful life. The Neoplatonists and some others among Western thinkers, including the Gnosis, took the attitude that, to a measure, science is a kind of food for the objective mind. Man taking science into his mind, working with it, comes out with electric toasters, automobiles, synthetic fabrics, hormones, and antihistamines. <laughs> At least he comes out with something. And according to the label on all the packages, these medications are effective, except in approximately one case out of a hundred. And in that case, you may get side symptoms. These side symptoms may include anything from your hair falling out to dropping dead. But that means that you are not one of the 99 who will respond favorably to this particular medication. You are the black sheep, in other words. But when all kinds of ideas go into philosophy, and somebody spends many, many years learning to be a philosopher, what comes out? Well, perhaps it is fortunate that no histamines do come out. But what else comes out? Usually, absolutely nothing. The individual does not build better mousetraps. He does not do anything that seems to cause him to be admirable or venerated. But most you can expect of him is talk. And most of the talk does not make sense to anyone else, and sometimes we doubt if it does to him. So there is this lack of productivity. Now, there is something wrong in the system, or this would not happen, because as uh, science should lead the objective mind 
into creative self-expression. So philosophy should lead the subjective inner consciousness mind of the individual and cause it to manifest outwardly into his life as creative activity. In other words, a philosopher, because he is a philosopher, should be a person of action, who does things, who solves problems, who creates solutions, who leads various processes from confusion to order. Actually, your philosopher, like the philosopher king of Plato, is your ideal statesman. He is your ideal counselor, your ideal legislator. He is the ideal person behind nearly all forms of specialized knowledge. Yet today we have the specialized knowledge and nothing much in the form of philosophical insight behind it. And we have the specialist in philosophy whose vision seldom leads to new and useful improvements in our way of life. Thus, instead of awakening or arousing the psychic life of man, philosophy acts as an opiate upon it. It dulls it, puts it to sleep in abstraction or creates for it a mysterious internal neurotic life of speculation and contemplation, an imaginary world into which the individual may flee to escape the pressures of factual circumstances which he does not wish to accept. In this type of keeping also philosophy becomes the doctrine of evasions, by which the individual with a little logic and less reason is able to clear himself of all responsibility for his own conduct and to blame the world for all the misfortunes that occur to him. Thus philosophy, uh, in this way, is not much use to us in preparing a new way of life for our modern time. We can no longer simply build upon the academic systems of philosophy any more than we can build firmly upon the creedal systems of theology, or again upon the complete uh, scientific methods which are arising in this area of knowledge. We are not finding what we most need, and that is a moving force within ourselves to impel us, to direct us, to lead us in courses of right conduct. While it isn't always apparently convenient or the best thing to do uh, to go back and discuss people, because we have tried in a sense to point out that we cannot confuse people with ideas, but we have to to a measure because history has done it to us. It has given us a vocabulary with limited words and it has forced us to the use of simile and similitude in order to express our own meanings. So therefore we can go back into philosophy in this sense. And while we cannot say that philosophy is identical with any philosopher, we can say to ourselves, what manner of person who has been a philosopher best exemplifies the fullest expression of philosophical method? In other words, what has philosophy most accomplished for those most accomplished persons who have uh, accepted it as a way of life. Well, I think we have a good example of this type of insight in Socrates. Socrates was certainly not a Pacific dreamer. He did not sit around uh, dealing out abstractions to a few chosen patricians. First of all, Socrates had the reputation of annoying more people than anyone that ever lived in Athens. This was healthy, at least. He was out making himself felt as a force in the life of his people. Socrates also had a wonderful reputation for being a brave defender of his city. Uh, when the time came and the Greeks had to go out to war to protect their commonwealth, 
Socrates was in the front row of the army. When the enemy saw him there, they divided and went on each side of him. No one wanted to face this doughty soldier. Uh, Socrates was also a man of extraordinary self-discipline. For in part of his guard duty, it is said that he stood motionless, barefooted in the snow up to his knees for 24 hours. This is a pretty good test of something. In other words, this man had begun to discipline himself. We know that he was very clever in the argument and debate, that he was ruthless in his attack upon hypocrisy and subterfuge, and that he also was a person of such grave courage that he cheerfully and willingly chose death before the compromising of his convictions. Philosophy had done something for this man. Some will say this man did something for philosophy. Perhaps both may be true. But here we have a person to whom great learning gave not an impotence of character, but a tremendous impetus to power. This person used philosophy to create a great life for himself and left an imperishable heritage for those who came after him. Now we begin to think of philosophy as meaning. It suddenly has significance for us. And we check others of similar abilities and similar dedications. And we find that philosophy in its best form, in its living form, has always strengthened the individual against the uncertainties of his time, rooted him in reasonable and rational convictions, protected him from fanaticism, superstition, and fear, and overcome in him that other strange impotence which arises from ignorance. So philosophy becomes a nourishment or a food or a medicine for the infirmities of human character. It gives the person the power to put his own life in order. Well, this we need, and we need it as we never needed it before. We also realize that in every generation in which philosophy has arisen, philosophers were more or less solitary people. I don't think that there was ever an age in which the world agreed uh, upon honoring philosophers. Some nations honored them more than others, but for the most part they were solitary miracles of nature arising in the most unlikely places and uncertain times, revealing their strength often against a background of extraordinary corruption. And uh, gradually their names and memories have come to be honored, although perhaps they were little known in their own time. So philosophy was not the result of a fortunate world. Uh, the great truths of life were not given to mankind in some blessed period when all was going well. They came at the most critical periods in the life of our people. Buddhism was brought to India in a period of great corruption in India, at a time when practically all values were falling apart. Christianity was given to the Near East at one of the most tragic periods in the life of the Syrian peoples, the period of their bondage to the Roman Empire, and still green in their memories the remembrance of the Babylonish captivity. Therefore, this period was not a period of great happiness. China received Confucius at a time when China's culture was at a dangerous degree of decadence, and Confucius fought all his life to find one honest prince who would establish the proper reforms for the state. These men all lived in difficult times. They were individuals who were strong in the midst of the weakness of those around them. They were not the products of social security or old age pensions. They were not uh, the product 
of the policy of the four-hour day or the three-day week. They were not the products of extraordinary luxuries, of unusual opportunities. When most of these individuals lived and flourished, there was no such a thing as a public school. These individuals learned, perhaps from wandering or itinerant teachers, or because of their own abilities and peculiar powers, were apprenticed to some scholar or teacher for his instruction. These people were therefore products out of themselves. Leonardo da Vinci was not merely a diploma graduate from some other institution. He was a creative thinker in his own right. He arose, it is true, in a time in which uh, there was great emphasis upon culture and cultural things, but most of the emphasis was bad. It was the emphasis of the court of the Borgias and the Medici. Leonardo Rose is a great human being, and in his genius was apparently parentless and without forebear or even cultural sire. He was a tremendous force in himself. And this has been true of great philosophy wherever this mysterious power has revealed itself. It is not something that has been communicated from one person to another until it finally died of boredom. Philosophy has been a sudden flashing blaze of insight, breaking through the darkness from the inside of man, coming through into his exterior activity as a tremendous moral conditioning ethical force. This is what we are striving to reclaim or rediscover in our time. And we do have a great deal of ground upon which to build, but unfortunately no one much is building on it. Other lines of thought have become the fads of the hour, and it is impossible to build a great system of ethics upon a fad. It has to be built upon a long, enduring concept of value. Everyone who is interested in comparative religion, mysticism, and related subjects is to a degree within the order of the philosophic field. Philosophy belongs to him. He belong to, belongs to its world. He is making a journey through life, <clears throat> and the only way this journey can be made adequately is with the aid of philosophy. So what are we going to do about it in our daily thinking? How are we going to start in our modern world to determine what is good in philosophy? I think we have several choices, but these choices are all of them based upon something that moves in us. Philosophy is not something which we can fully accept merely by acknowledging it mentally. We can say to ourselves, I have read twenty books on philosophy, and I think this is the best one. Therefore, this one I will now accept. And as a result of that, I would like to be known from this point on as a follower of that system. And regardless of what uh, other people think or other people like, from now on I am a Cartesian. I am a follower of the philosophy of René Descartes. This is wonderful, but it dies there. If we are extremely literate, we might do a new book on Descartes, which means that we will pick out quotations from older books, put them together, and write a preface. Because actually Descartes said himself what he wanted to say. But no one has been allowed to let it rest there. And there have probably been thousands of people who told Descartes, in the form of books, what he originally meant. And the chances are he would not recognize any of them. <laughs> but this is what we do. But we are now a Cartesian. And we look around us to see what difference this has made in our lives, and we see no particular difference. 
we still have the same appetites for breakfast, we still have the same trouble with our neighbors, and we are still rather unhappy in our employment. These things haven't changed. We get tired, worried, and frightened, just as we did before we called ourselves Cartesians. So we have a new name for something. For what? Well, simply for a nominal allegiance. Some time ago, before the war, Japan was in a spot of this kind. It was beginning to develop a little international trade that wanted to do something uh, to kind of build up good feeling with the principal markets. So the, it was brought before the dip of Japan as to whether or not Japan would become a nominally Christian nation. Some Japanese got up and pointed out that there were nominally very few Christians in Japan, that this might present a slight problem. And the Oriental, with a naivete, naivete that was worthy of anything we can produce in this country, and that's pretty good, pointed out that it wasn't necessary for Japan to have any Christians in order to be nominally Christian. All you had to do was say what you are and keep on believing what you had always believed. It was very simple. The whole thing was purely, shall we say, an adjustment for the sake of import and export. It might be easier to trade, you see, with other people who didn't think you were a heathen. So here is how you get to be a nominal philosopher. You believe as you have always done, but you give it a new name. And as nobody else knows what it is either, you are suspected of being a, an outstanding example. This means that acceptance has become the key to the whole thing. But acceptance isn't anything. Acceptance is trying to hang something on the outside. Uh, acceptance is trying to gain a new personality with a haircut. Acceptance has something to do with putting a new kind of an appearance on things, but leaving the substance of those things unchanged. And this is where philosophy uh, has gotten a poor reputation for itself. Actually, we can study, but when we have read 25 books and we now wait in our own minds to see which one we're going to follow, or whether we're going to be followers of Rene Descartes or good old Bishop Berkeley and his tar water, the question that now arises is, which code of conduct do we expect to live by? This is a tricky question for most people, because they have a perfect solid intention to live by the same code they've always lived by. But it will be nice to gain a little intellectual luster and a high polish. But it's not going to affect what they do to any marked degree. There is a belief if you study it long enough, it may sink in, but most people don't live that long, so that it doesn't sink in. Actually, if you're going to work on it this way, if you're going to take a number of books and read them, or study a nice survey of philosophy and try to decide which is the most important, then there's only, one, there's only one way to do this. It's not by an acceptance by the mind. The question is, if you're quite still and quite quiet about the whole thing, uh, which of these different things you have read creates the greatest sense of aliveness inside yourself? Uh, which one of these things suddenly restores a little faith in human nature, uh, makes you uh, really impelled to take a new and more constructive view on life. When you can say to yourself, yes, this particular philosophy has given me something, for from now on I can no longer hate anyone, then uh, if it's true, then philosophy is beginning to operate. Or if uh, an individual who has been rather fanatical and bigoted in many of his points of view says that he has found a philosophy uh, that shows him that he was wrong, that he is admitting that he is wrong, 
and still more important, he has ceased doing that which he knows now is wrong. Then philosophy has become a dynamic. Then philosophy is changing the person from inside himself. It has converted his consciousness, not his intellect. It has touched his emotions, by which he feels a new sense of value. It has given him a more rational group of sympathies about things, about persons, about ideas. If this has begun to operate in him, we know then what the uh, what Plotinus meant when he said to the young man who came to him, Make philosophy thy journey. Life is a journey, and this life journey is most important if it is a journey in philosophy to philosophy. If it is a journey toward greater enlightenment. If a philosophy enables you to suddenly say to yourself, I am ignorant, then this philosophy is good. It is doing something. But if after reading all these philosophies you reject all that do not agree with yourself and say, well, there's one thing that's certain, dear old Bishop Berkeley uh, agrees with me. He must have been right. If we take this attitude, we're totally lost again. So uh, philosophy has to be something that awakens a sleeping respect for value within the person, so that having accepted it, he can no longer be the person that he was prior to this acceptance, that for him truly philosophy is a new birth in time. It is a dropping away of an old self. It is a metamorphosis. It is the caterpillar truly building its cocoon and then breaking forth again as the radiant moth. It is a reintegration of life around a dynamic that is valuable to us. Now, what is the primary dynamic in philosophy? Well, the great purpose of philosophy, which like all ultimate purposes, transcends the capacity of any man in his present state of consciousness from achieving that purpose, but its great ultimate goal is that man shall know truth. That beyond everything else, the most important thing in the world is truth. That the truth of a thing is much more than the fact of a thing. Uh, we think we know the truth when we say that water runs downhill. This is a fact, but not a truth. A truth has to be much bigger than this. It is a fact that we have alternation of day and night, but this is not a truth. A truth is in reality and substance the internal reality or validity of a thing. The truth about it is the fact about the principles upon which it operates. The truth about it is the true reason for itself, the cause of itself, the nature of itself, and the purpose of itself, all continued or considered together as one a fact, superior over fact about this thing. So truth means that man, as far as he is concerned, must know the origin of himself, his own purpose and reason for existence, and his own destiny. Man must know with absolute certainty what the power is that governs the world. He must know with certainty what the power is that governs himself. He must know what his own consciousness is, what his own intellect is. He must understand the dynamic forces and vitalities of the universe. He must have a clear vision of the eternal purpose of things. And all this must be correct. It must be above and beyond all dogma and all conflict. 
and it must transcend any opinionism, any selfish futility which may be in his own nature. Therefore, to achieve this state of truth, man must know. And this knowledge must be knowledge of things that are primary and not knowledge of things that are secondary. Secondary ma knowledge puts man into orbit now around the earth. Primary knowledge puts man's culture into orbit around the radiant center of reality. Until this happens, his culture is insecure. Therefore, truth has to do with the salvation of empires. Truth has to do with the eternities of human progress. Truth has to do with the facts of survival and the inevitability of values which are entirely beyond scientific speculation. Truth has to do with the power of the individual to relax because of an absolute core of certainty within himself which is indestructible. Truth has to do with man's continuing unfoldment of ethics, his fairness, his vitality to good, his uh, absolute dedication to principle above profit. These things have to do with truth, and on that basis truth is very deficient in our modern world. Pilate asked, what is truth? And Jesus was silent. Yet it is the problem of philosophy to search for this truth, and to realize that the search for truth is the primary end of life. Therefore, Plotinus says, make philosophy your journey. And this philosophy, as Plotinus also said, is that mysterious journey of the alone to that which is forever alone. It is a journey within ourselves which leads from the uncertainty of ignorance to the certainty and benevolence of total understanding. Now, it would seem that such things would be interesting. We know that an individual who gains great distinction in music uh, is applauded and very often listened to in rapture by persons who really do not understand too much about music but whose hearts sing when it is well performed. We know that people are interested and profoundly influenced by the skill of the scientist or the skill in any area of daring and courage. We applaud these things. Why then do we have no place in our way of life to applaud this journey toward insight? Why do we not actually recognize uh, that the greatest of all persons, most worthy of our respect, is that person who makes this journey? And that the journey itself is the supreme profession to which life should be dedicated. Now this journey in, in and toward truth is by the very nature of our way of life, not a, a journey in the sense of a complete separation of man from one form of knowledge in the quest of another. Philosophy does not say to the man, you cannot be a mathematician anymore, you cannot be an astronomer, you cannot be a lawyer, or you cannot buy and sell merchandise. Philosophy says no such thing. Philosophy rather says that in all of these activities and outlets normal to man are to be found the essential elements of the philosophic life itself. Philosophy is not the result of turning from the world and seeking the values of aloneness. So, um, philosophy is an alonely search because it represents an individual moving from a very strong interior motive 
through a world that does not understand this motive or appreciate it. But actually, to be the true philosopher, the individual must be universally informed. There is no philosophical maturity that can result from bigotry or from prejudice or from the restriction and limitation of interests. The individual who lives most becomes wisest. There is no great virtue in escaping life. The virtue is to move through life, accepting it on its various levels according to its true worth, and then moving through these experiences into the maturity of the power to experience within ourselves. So philosophy becomes actually of the principal teacher by which the purposes of life are integrated or organized so that we no longer live in a universal accident. We no longer struggle on in a cosmic dilemma. We are no longer convinced that we are going nowhere at several thousand miles a minute. We suddenly find that philosophy takes the world, the universe, and everything in it and gradually begins the process of organization. It makes this world acceptable to the thoughtful person because he has endowed this world with the power of his own thoughtfulness. But he is trained, he is wise, he is scholarly, therefore he is not going to be foolish in his thoughtfulness. Now, this begins another very important thing. Philosophy, it is said, begins in thoughtfulness. Now, how do we get to be thoughtful? Well, we can listen to all the commentators, uh, particularly on the radio and television. By means of this, we will guarantee that no one will be thoughtful. We can also read all the opinions of the learned, the latest books on all the subjects of international and national intrigue, uh, we can keep on our quiet little problem of hating everyone we, know no, we do not know and being suspicious of everyone that we do know. But this does not add anything to thoughtfulness. Thoughtfulness is a process of thinking. And how do we learn to think? We don't have to. Man was created with the power to think. The only thing we have to do is to give this power a chance. So if the individual does not think badly, he will think right. So it isn't necessary for him to know what is right in order to think. It is only necessary for him to discover what is not right and stop doing it. If he will follow this very simple rule, he will soon begin thinking straight. Because he will always think straight if he doesn't put an obstacle in his own way. If he insists, however, on building a crooked path and walking in it, then he will not think straight. But his own thought has as its natural inclination to think with the universal mind. There is a power that rules and regulates the mental energy of the universe. And the natural process of this mental energy is to be intelligent. Therefore, you have to settle down to the slow and careful process of gradually indoctrinating intelligence out of this thought process. What we are really doing is taking long postgraduate courses in how to be ignorant. <laughs> and when we have prevented ourselves from having a natural thought, then we graduate with honor. So if you want to think, you will think, and you will think true, if you do not encourage yourself in the sordid luxury of thinking badly. If you settle down quietly to eliminating these things which are not thought,
but which can tantalize, irritate, and destroy thought processes, you will end with a very gentle, wise attitude. This is your Zen formula, very simple. It is that you will think right when you stop thinking wrong. This is easier because it is difficult for us to understand how to think right. We don't know what right is, really. But we all know that we've gotten into trouble thinking the way we do. This is factual. Therefore, our first job is to stop doing the kind of thinking that we know gets us into trouble. As we gradually recover from this group of bad habits, we observe that in the place of the wrong thinking, better thinking comes. We cannot be dishonest inside and think straight. So we discover, as we go along through life, that we are subject to a series of attitudes which destroy philosophic insight. Because of these attitudes, we never can get two and two to make four, no matter how hard we try. Because somewhere between the two and the other two, uh, is imposed a hatred, a fear, a doubt, a prejudice, uh, a false or unreasonable allegiance, an antagonism. And as a result of that, our thinking is bound to go bad. The individual who is an atheist writes a book on atheism. It is of profound interest to other atheists and to no one else, because he has written from a position in which he is no longer able to think straight. He is only able to think such thoughts as atheism will permit to arise in his own mind. He has made atheism the keeper of his mind. Therefore, it will never testify against itself. But had he taken the opposite viewpoint, the same mind would have served him just as enthusiastically. It is his own position in the pattern. So if we want to start thinking reasonably straight, we just simply stop thinking in ways that are not straight. And we point out that this isn't easy because of the continuing pressure of circumstances. But we still have to do it if we want to make philosophy our journey in life. Philosophy is searching forever to find honesty. And to a measure, this thinking straight is this search for honesty. The great abode of honesty is nature. All of nature's processes are essentially honest. The great abode of dishonesty is man, inasmuch as man is the creature who has developed a series of faculties which enable him to defy nature and go into conflict with it. So man can sell man a bill of goods, but man can never sell it to nature. Nature continues to be itself and to perform its own works in a complete and dedicated honesty. To make, then, philosophy a vital force in a life without going into systems of philosophy, the main point is to realize that there is actually no system of philosophy. What we call systems are simply outstanding exponents of certain general convictions about truth. And some of these exponents undoubtedly were better informed than others. Some of these exponents will appeal more to us than others. And some of them have a longer life in time than others. Now, there are many philosophers who flourished 300 years ago whose ideas and opinions would have been very little, have been of very little value to us in the last 25 years. Uh, they belong so completely to a time, to a system, to a concept, that as that time, system, and concept perished in limbo, their significance as thinkers ceased also. There are miles of books in the great museum libraries of the world that will never be read again because no one is concerned with their contents. What little truth might be in them is so drowned in words that it is easier to search elsewhere. 
There are other philosophers who, having greater insight, have gradually been justified by time. And so out of the past, we recognize those whose appeal to our day will be very limited, or who have only certain special contributions to make. We also recognize there were some to whom perhaps we are just beginning to come into understanding. They have already lived long before, but their thoughts still transcend the present and go into the future. So we look around us to find the kind of thoughts around which to build a way of life. We use the thoughts of these people to the degree that they are helpful, but we do not need to feel that we must cling to their boundaries or their syllogisms or their dichotomies and things of this nature because we are going to move gradually out of these arbitrary concepts. We do have two great schools of philosophy, East and West. Both of these schools represent man's conditioned reaction to unconditioned values. And as man changes, his reactions will be different. But the values will be ever the same. Values do not change. It is only man's ability to accept, use, and interpret values that change, that changes. So that man today will take the same principles, but he will find a contemporary usage. Or will restate them in other words, sometimes fortunate, often unfortunate. But we do have certain concepts which we call philosophical that do endure and that do continue to be meaningful, but only meaningful if we can get them inside of our own consciousness, get them in where they will start to work rather than merely to regard them like great scenery or the marvelous antiques of a gallery as something to be seen and to be left behind. In uh, searching then for these contemporary things, we know what philosophy can do or must do if it is to make a contribution to our way of life. We are past that golden age of the philosophy of the child heart and the child mind. We are past those simple days when philosophy uh, was very largely an application to the most common incidents of human existence. We have come into a highly involved, highly complicated civilization in which every common sense fact and principle is deeply and cunningly concealed. Thus we have a different kind of world, but our problem remains the same. We all know today that our problem is essentially a, an ethical one. And ethics is one of the branches of philosophy. Thus our great need, philosophical, philosophically speaking today, is ethics. And how are we going to get uh, this new foundation in ethical conviction? The first thing that philosophy points out is that a need always bespeaks a lack of something. When we get in a position where our cause becomes desperate, it is because we need something that we do not have. Or perhaps, by reverse, that we have something that we do not need. But actually, the primary point is that we are in need. Every individual in an emergency is a person in need. He may have money in the bank, but he is still in need. Consequently, an emergency can only be finally solved by the meeting of the need which caused that emergency. So we look around us and we say, what do we need? Ninety-nine percent of people believe that they need happiness. They don't have it. 
or they do not have it with any sense of security. Another group feel that they need peace of mind. Another that they need peace of soul. Still another group feels that they need health. Many people feel that they need sympathy, they need understanding, they need friendship. They need the confidence of other people. They need to increase their own confidence. Some feel a pressing need for increased earning power. Some need relief uh, from sickness. Others need relief from the tangled circumstances of their own mistakes. But everyone is more or less in need. When that need becomes generally manifest, then that which is needed becomes most generally necessary. If there is then a common need, there is a great common answer that is most necessary. All the things that we indicate that we need today all of these exist because of the lack of adequate internal integration. All the things that we really need to make ourselves happy must now, as always, come out of ourselves. Nothing imposed upon us can solve any of these problems. Efforts have been made. I know people who have complained for years that if they only had a friend, life would just be a song. Finally, the f friend came along, and in a few weeks, this individual managed to transform them into an enemy. <laughs> the friend didn't solve anything, because the friend was only a symbol of a need that was inside of the person. When he got a friend, he didn't even know enough to keep that friend, and lost them and added to tragedy. The individual who says, all I need is enough to retire on, well, we know his story. He never has enough. The individual who says, if I could only have this, I will be happy, is unhappy before it's delivered. <laughs> He has a new thing that he must now have in order to make him happy, and so it goes. None of these needs can be solved simply by the shifting of the physical situations of life. All of these needs bear witness to an inadequacy within the self. There is no solution until this inadequacy is met. So how are we going to meet it? Different systems, different schools all suggest various ways. One says that the educated person can solve his problems, but the needs of the educated are as great as the needs of the uneducated. <coughs> Another one says all we have to do is wait a little longer and science will meet all our needs. Well, there will be there's a way in which it can do so by simply creating a situation in which Having become defunct, we no longer need anything. That is one answer to the problem, but not an encouraging one. Religion is supposed to help us to meet these needs. Today we have 80 million nominally religious persons in the United States, and they are on the top of the list with their needs along with everybody else. None of these institutions solve needs because institutions cannot solve needs. The most that an individual, the most that an institution can do is to point out to the individual how he can solve his need. It cannot solve it for him, because every solution has to arise in an unfoldment of character. Unless this is achieved, there can be no solution. Plato, Plotinus, Buddha, all held that what we now call philosophy was the science of character. That by means of philosophy, man became aware of the eternal code of existence. 
and that by becoming aware of this code and learning gradually to obey this code, the individual rescued himself from all need and all dilemma. That there is no other way. Evasion of this philosophic insight or philosophic growth must therefore simply result in the continuance of the need. There can be no solution to the problems around man except the solution that arises through the enlightenment that is generated within man. So philosophy stands for this enlightenment. It is the particular area of philosophy uh, to attempt the maturing of the character of the person. This means now, how shall we attempt to mature this character? Philosophy would say that, of course, all of life should combine to make this maturing easier. All systems of knowledge should be in common agreement that the final purpose of man is the unfoldment of his own nature. What can be a more universal concept? Who can deny that all progress roots in this? Who can deny that a scientist must develop and unfold his own scientific potentials? How oh, can we deny that the theologian must become a greater person in order to be a greater teacher of theology? How can we deny that the worshiper must be a better person if he is to worship more wisely and conscientiously. Therefore, the, the development or growth of character is the most important thing that man can accomplish. And all the defects of society are revelations in nature of the defects in man as far as human society is concerned. There can be no remedy of this society unless this remedy moves from within man. And that is why is that social revolution cannot essentially or immediately result in the improvement of the race. Social revolution is turning the barrel over and taking out the bottom instead of the top. But the same thing is in the barrel. And social revolution only assists to the degree that it contributes to human experience, and that perhaps after centuries of this struggle, we then finally accept the inevitable fact that the end of all progress is the development of human character. If this is true, and education could not deny it, although it makes little of it, why are we in this difficulty? We're in this difficulty because every institution that is necessary to enlarge and promote the advancement of character is under the control of individuals of inadequate character. Therefore, these individuals neither know what is necessary, nor would they have the courage to achieve what is necessary. Thus, the very instruments necessary for the fulfillment of our character needs are in the keepings of individuals who are unable uh, to use these instruments for the purpose that was intended. This means that instead of being able to start at the parent's <laughs> knee in the mystery of the growth of character, the individual has to start after he leaves school, where the schooling will not bestow it. Uh, this, perhaps, is part of nature's evolutionary procedure. Thousands of years ago, when man was less mature, actually, psychically, than he is now, well, while we are confused today, we are confused on much bigger and better things than our ancestors were, and that means that our confusion is more perfect and more colossal. But actually, 
we have a greater capacity, a greater developed potential than we have ever possessed before, and that is why our mistakes are becoming increasingly dangerous. But there was a time when man was practically like an animal, and the shepherds, the priests of the temples, the old philosophical guides, the initiation and ritual systems uh, were institutions in the physical world. They took young and promising candidates, indoctrinated them, taught them, brought them up, and made them, uh, we might say, the custodians of their own culture. This has disappeared from our way of life. There are no longer any convenient sanctuaries where we can turn with certainty for essential enlightenment. This, however, probably is good. It simply is telling us, in our quiet way, that we're supposed to be able to take care of this ourselves by now. That the individual is given the greater opportunity and the greater inducement, the greater reward, which will result from making these decisions as a result of personal need. But we are all suffering from the same problem that children in school suffer from. A child going to school and studying with its classmates uh, manages to maintain a certain score or average simply because of the pressure of the group around it. Take this child out of a compulsory educational system and let it try to study by itself when it pleases, and the child would get nowhere. Even the adult seldom does. It is only a great dedication that will cause the adult to stay with any program of self-improvement with the same dedication uh, that would be evident if he was attending some institution of learning. So it is harder for the average person to discipline himself than to be disciplined by a formal structure existing around him. But in the search for value today, in the search for this necessary thing, each person has to take over the job of his own education. He has to come to the conclusion that there are these needs and that he will do something about them. If he doesn't come to this conclusion, he will drift along and die in the same needs he has now. After a while, his complaints will no longer be heard, but this is not the sign of his spiritual victory, but the victory of the mortician. This means that we go out of this life and cease to irritate others, but in all probabilities continue to irritate ourselves in the hereafter. Unless these needs are met, there is no solution. Somewhere along the line, philosophy has to move in upon each of us. Perhaps it is the rather simple idealistic philosophy of Emerson that moves in, a very gracious New England philosophy, but a philosophy that had a great deal of real value in it, because it was a philosophy of a dignified human being living a dignified existence. It was a philosophy of an individual who not only dared to be an individual, but found the experience not only a gracious one, but others around him found it also quite gracious. Here Emerson was studying Indian philosophy, yoga, Vedanta, and the Bhagavad Gita, at a time when certainly his neighbors in Concord, Massachusetts, didn't know what it was all about. They all said that Dr. Emerson was a strange one. They always referred to him as a strange one. His servants thought he was still stranger. His family was never very sure about this uh, rather austere, tyrannical, but highly benevolent character that lived among them. He was just a strange one. But when his house burned down, the whole town got together and rebuilt it for him. They liked this strange one. He was a kind of a nice, interesting, friendly problem. He was always something to talk about, and he didn't care when they were talking about him, they were leaving some less fortunate soul alone. <laughs> so they rebuilt his house for him, and he lived in the quiet shade of the family elms to leave a wonderful heritage 
of quietude, of benevolence, of mature thoughtfulness, and uh, to really be the leader of this great Amazonian group that represented some of the finest men and women of letters that our country has ever produced. But it was a gracious kind of understanding, uh, understanding that was built upon an acceptance of universal law and a little quiet Hinduism sifted through Unitarian theology. It was a beautiful mixture. But nobody at that time knew enough about either Hinduism or Unitarianism to know that either one was not orthodox, which was a delightful situation. And Emerson remained an enigma, just a strange one. But his strangeness has enriched our way of life immeasurably. If we could always be just a little of this graciousness and the strange one at the same time, we wouldn't have many enemies, and if our house burned down, some would probably try to help us build it again. Uh, this philosophy does not actually make people dislike us. It may make them wonder a little bit, but if we are gracious about it all, and don't parade a lot of knowledge we never attempt to apply ourselves, we will be accepted, even enjoyed, be a uh, cherished source of conversation, and, and perhaps we'll leave behind a heritage of value to others. But we have to start somewhere. And to start in this philosophical journey, uh, the Zen theory probably is about as good for Eastern or Western man as any you can think of. The beginning of philosophy, then, is to sit down and think a few simple things through. Thinking them through with the, with the mind freed from prejudice, freed from false addictions and adherences, and from detachments and attachments both. And the individual can sit down and think very definitely something like this. What do I really need? Some people will say, well, almost everything. Perhaps we're afraid of, of old age. Perhaps we're afraid of poverty, afraid of pain, afraid of sickness. These different needs all come moving in upon us. Uh, but, uh, as one old gentleman said, who finally worked these needs out to his own contentment, he said, there's one thing I finally decided after ten years of suffering, namely that no one is going to starve to death in a welfare state, so we can relax on that one. <laughs> well, there are things like this that, that can burst through. They're very homely things. But they may take our minds from problems that are not really very solvable and put them onto problems that are solvable. Nine-tenths of people who after 70 or 65 have a lot of trouble getting along are people who were a little difficult to get along with before they were 65 and 70. The root of the problem goes back. Lonely people are, for the most part, people who have never had the knack or the understanding to build strong relationships with life. And as uh, various conditions shift around, these people find themselves more and more isolated. But this isolation is due to character and not to circumstance in the majority of instances. These things can be controlled and directed and thought through if we want to. And when we get to thinking things through, we get to be philosophers. When we also add to the thinking through of things the resolution to find an answer to the problem of its immediate need, then we begin to understand values. We need all kinds of things. But all of this need springs from a primary need, and that is the need for personal insight, personal understanding, the wealth of personal consciousness. This is underneath it all. 
So we begin to examine ourselves as to how this need, this great need, is operating. The individual who has no aesthetic life, who cannot appreciate a good book, who doesn't know a picture from uh, a scrawl, who has never read a book of poetry because, as Gato says, he doesn't like verse that jogs and jiggles, people who have none of these values then turn around and say they're bored. They're bored because they have no sense of the development of appreciation for value. Then there are people with nothing to do, surrounded by a world of things that need to be done. These people simply have not reached out and come to valuable conclusions about their own abilities and the things they can do. There is always something wrong in the thinking of the person in whose life something is wrong. We're all going to be that way. This isn't in any way a reflection upon anyone. We're all going to pass out of here in need of something. But we don't need to need quite as much as we do. There are some common needs we could take care of. And we think of these needs only in terms of poverty. But the great poverty is poverty of consciousness. And when we are poor in consciousness, we are poor indeed. And most of us are poor in consciousness because we are poor in our deeds. We haven't gotten out and done things that needed doing. So getting down to our quietude and trying to think the thing through philosophically, we have to come, ultimately, to certain recommendations about our own conduct. If we do not, then we have simply been lying to ourselves. But if we have tried sincerely to be honest, we know there are things we are doing poorly that we should be doing better. Now, philosophy has to give us the incentive to do these things better. It has to do so because it is reasonable. Because philosophy moves the entire process of life from accident to purpose. Nothing remains left to chance anymore. And having luck removed from our way of life, we have to substitute merit. There is nothing left. So we move gradually on the merit system. We come to the conclusion that whatever we want, we must work for. And that whatever achievement we attain must result from an appropriate amount of effort directly imposed upon this project. If, for example, we say to ourselves, I would like to look forward to the last 20 years of my life being happy, well-adjusted, useful, cheerful, reasonably helpful years. This is a big thing to ask for. We're asking for much more than a million dollars because a million dollars cannot produce one of those factors. We are asking much more than fame or high office. We are asking about all that is good in life and all that life of value can bestow upon us. We are asking to be able to draw out of the bank the most valuable resources on earth. Therefore, we have to make some kind of a budget plan or something to get these resources. When we're buying a home, we go in debt and we pay and pay and pay for 15 or 20 years, and by the time we get it paid for, it's fallen apart. But we think nothing of this. We're buying a home. This is a noble experiment, a noble purpose. We may die before it's paid for also, but we're still buying a home, somebody's home, or for somebody. We don't know just who. But we don't think anything of going without a lot of luxuries month after month in order to make that payment in which, in which the first ten years mostly interest. 
How do we expect, then, to build a character without some effort to set up a system of payment? If we are willing to work hard in order to earn enough, to spend enough, to keep ourselves comfortable, how do we have to prepare to keep ourselves wise? A lot of people believe that they're born wise. The only difficulty is they're never able to prove it. <laughs> Actually, we are born with the potential of building these securities we need. But if we just don't do anything about them, we will never have them. An individual who doesn't build a career may drift through 20 jobs until he reaches an age when he's no longer employable, and then he sits down and begins to wonder what happened to him. Same is true in the problem of character. An individual doing nothing with character, doing nothing to build it, drifts along until he gets himself into such a horrible problem by his own compromising and his own ignorance that there is just no way out. He is completely floored. He has never built anything, therefore he never has anything. So character begins wherever we discover we need it and begins by setting up a regime in us which we have to live with every day. And if we work at character as hard as we work at profits, we will end up with the profits of character. This doesn't mean we neglect the other, because fortunately they do not actually conflict. No one says a good businessman has to have a vile temper. No one says that a good mother has to be a gossip. These do not conflict. Character is the building of an inner life that parallels the development of our outer life, and perhaps should lead it and inspire it. But if we want to have this happy last twenty years of life, we have to build for it. We have to start in as soon as we can. It wouldn't be too late uh, if we started at near the end. It wouldn't be too soon if we started the day we were born. But whenever we do start, we have to work with it as assiduously as possible, giving constant, constructive, kindly, happy thought to the building of this destiny that we want. And we have to do it by enriching friendships by building the faith of other people, by uh, bringing into the lives of our children values so real that those children become very closely and deeply attached to us by natural and proper attachments and not by the forceful attachments of duty and discipline. We have to maintain a certain equity in our spending, in our saving, in order that we may have reasonable probability of attaining the end that we want. We have to also increase the insight of our inner lives, so that as our physical activities become more restricted, our inner life takes over, and instead of aloneness being lonely, aloneness is a magnificent adventure in the use of the stored-up inner consciousness which we have been accumulating through the years. Now, some will say this is a pipe dream, but there are people who do it. And these people win. The one who doesn't win is the person who doesn't do it. So you can start at any point to begin to plan a reasonable life. And the planning of a reasonable life is the highest form of philosophy. And all that philosophy and all its academic measures can possibly provide is some help, some in incentives, some enlightenments, some rules and regulations by means of which some of these things can be estimated more correctly. And most of the world's greater thinkers in philosophy have been more or less uh, thinkers who have mingled schools of philosophy according to their own needs, forming a kind of eclecticism a philosophy that has been called a poor man's philosophy. 
but one which in reality has a lot of good thoughts in it. Let's, for example, say an individual wants to know how he should conduct himself. How should you act? Well, Immanuel Kant's categorical imperative still remains as one of the best definitions of that. If you want to know how you should act, all you have to say, if the way I conduct myself became a universal procedure and everyone acted the same way, would this constitute the greatest good for all? Well, that's a good question. In fact, many people feel that it is a far truer and greater statement than the Golden Rule. Because people may not want you to do to them what they are doing to you. That's quite not necessarily a good practical notion. But if the way you acted became the code by which everyone acted, would you be happy in the system? If your conduct returned to you from everyone you knew, would you say, my, what a nice lot of people? <laughs> or would you say to yourself, I hope I never see them again? <laughs> if you carry just a little story to someone else, would you like everyone in the world to be carrying stories about you to everyone else? Would you want to have that kind of thing the way of life? If you nag a little more than is necessary, would you like to live in a world in which the echo of nagging is never missing from the hills? <laughs> would you like to live where everything is echoing and re-echoing one nag after another? If you are trying to get along at someone else's expense, would you like the whole world to be trying to get along at your expense? If you don't care for somebody and you're living with them only because it's profitable, would you like all the world to do the same thing and maybe do it to you? These are questions. And I think Kant has a rather good answer. Now, that's the way philosophy can sneak into a situation and give you a little help. Schools of philosophy can say to you, here are rules. If you think these rules through, you'll probably do fairly well. Therefore, we can go to another's problem of life, and we can say, according to philosophy, what is the highest virtue that a person can practice? And uh, Socrates answers that question by saying that the highest virtue that a man can practice is to be himself, to be his real self. Now, if you say to yourself, well, if I practiced being myself, there wouldn't be much virtue in it, uh, that tells you the answer. That unless you can be yourself and at the same, in the same time be the best person you can think of, if in being yourself you are less than virtue, then you have not cultivated the greater virtue. Now, uh, someone else will say, uh, if I'm supposed to change my habits, which habits should I change first? Pythagoras says, change first that habit, the changing of which will change all other habits. In other words, you can start cutting one leaf off the tree at a time, or perhaps you can try to become a more moral person by the famous procedure that was used in bobbing the cat's tail, cutting off a little at a time so it would hurt less. <laughs> this procedure is what most of us try to do. We say, well, I'll get good by degrees because if I go too fast, it's going to hurt too much. <laughs> so in uh, that way, no good is ever done. But if we have to correct some vice in our nature, what vice should we correct? We, by the correction of which, we will correct most other vices. Buddha answered selfishness. If you can get rid of that, you can get rid of most everything. If you get rid of selfishness, most of the problems that betray us most frequently fall away. If you are not selfish, you do not wish advantage at the expense of others. 
this in itself relieves us of most of the conspiracies which burden life, most of the falseness of life, most bad marriages, uh, bo most poor business relationships, most unfair friendships arise from secret selfishness. An individual trying desperately to be happy is secretly very selfish. Now, some people are selfish physically, some mentally, some emotionally. But if you can weed out selfishness, you probably can come the nearest to reducing the general stock of troubles within your own nature. With the end of selfishness comes the end of opinionism, this desperate struggle to be always right which is almost certain to end in common misery. With the end of selfishness comes also uh, freedom from this desperate effort to possess, whether it be persons or things. And the unselfish individual gradually finds all other tensions uh, are reduced. He is then left with only one real problem, how to be intelligently unselfish. This is the surviving difficulty. But it is better to face this than it is to face the compound felonies resulting from selfishness. So if you want to dig out one basic characteristic, which has probably contributed more misery to you than anything else in all your life, go to work on selfishness. You will find that selfishness is not easy to uproot. Its roots are deep, and its tap roots go down to the deepest part of our ambitions. But until we get rid of it, we will never be able to hope for peace. Now, another problem that arises is, if all these things are true, and I have to work on this problem so desperately and so constantly, for it seems it's all like swimming against a stream. I feel like being selfish, I'm told I mustn't. I feel like disliking someone, I'm told I can't. I feel like I want something, I'm told I shouldn't want it. This all gets a battle between the instincts that we naturally desire to express and a code that is imposed upon us which we do not like. It's like saving. There's no particular fun in it unless we're misers. But we have to sometimes in order to achieve those ends which only thrift can accomplish. So always, instead of thinking of our being frustrated, we have to think in terms of some greater thing we want that is more important than the small things for which we are sacrificing character. But now comes the simple problem of where is the bomb in Gilead? Well, what salve are we going to use on these bruises and aches and pains that result from the process of trying to be good? Because it is, to most people, a rather painful procedure. So we try to find in philosophy now uh, the formula of how to be good without too much misery or too much assumed pain in the process. And philosophy again tells us very, very simply uh, that there is no pain in being good. That in what we call pain in being good, as Lao Tzu, the great Chinese mystic philosopher, points out, is simply the pain of being yourself in the presence of a world that is going in an opposite direction. Actually, you're not penalized for being good. You penalize yourself by looking around you and saying, look at all these people doing what they want to do. And because I'm a philosopher, I can't do it. <laughs> it's a perfectly desolating state of affairs. But if you're a philosopher, just wait a minute and see what is happening to these people who are doing the things that philosophy is trying to get you not to do. 
You say, my goodness, look at that man. He has that beautiful new car. He must have paid $5,000 for it, and I'm supposed not to cover it. I'm supposed to look placidly at this man and say, I'm glad you have it. And even as I'm saying it, I say to myself, I am a liar. I'm not glad he has it, because in my heart and soul, I know I'm the one who should have had it. Only he had the money. So this is the situation. But if instead of building this situation which causes pain, we simply relax and watch this world of people doing the thing that we feel philosophy is trying to prevent us from doing. I've watched this a long time, and I've seen what happens. I've seen the equivalent of the man with the new expensive car. And I've gone by that house later and seen the black wreath on the door. This man with the new car, the expensive home and everything, dropped dead one afternoon in his office. This is what we've been deprived of, not the car. We have faced the horrible misfortune of not being able to drop dead at 47. Because his way of life that resulted in this particular pattern, which to us seems so wonderful, was the way of life that destroyed him. For many years, an individual lived in continuous envy of a very wonderful family living next to them. This family must have been a family of great means, because servants did everything. And uh, the lady of the house was only seen flittingly, <laughs> moving from one magnificent room to another. Everything was very solemn, very snobbish, very set apart from everyone else, and the neighbors were just one mass of gossip. Here was an individual that must certainly be living the life of a royal princess. When the truth finally came out, the woman of that house was a hopeless alcoholic who was in delirium treatments most of the time, and finally committed suicide. The reason she never came out was the fact that she couldn't walk straight. And all the envy went up in bubbles. It is the same with everything. We look out at these things, and then philosophy says, don't envy this one frame of a large picture, look the picture through, you will then see that the only individual to whom you can direct envy is the man of character. He is the only one who in the end will come to anything worth envying. And that person you can be. That all these little things that seem uh, to be so worthwhile that we hate to give them up are actually the very things that are giving us our heartaches. That therefore we're not losing anything. It's no problem of regret. It's problem of getting our minds onto a different level of value in which that is regarded as worth emulating, which itself is the greatest good. Because it is only in that way that we can solve things. Now, it's nice enough to try to uh, you'll be acceptable by everyone else. It's wonderful to try to be regarded as a popular member of the community. It's wonderful to be in fashion and be in style and be, as they say today, on the top of the heap. But when you make all these sacrifices to the insanity of the time, and then something goes wrong with you, who cares? Who is going to come forward and say, well, you tried to be one with us. You made a splendid uh, showing in doing the things we all do. Therefore, now in your emergency, we'll all get together and get you out of it. Do they ever say that? No. They only simply say, poor old Joe, it served him right. <laughs> He, uh, he drank too much, of course, we made him do it, 
but uh, he will let us make him do it. Now he's gone. It's his own fault. He shouldn't have done it. So the rest keep right on going, doing their own way. The company gets a new sales manager, and everything goes on as before. The sales force makes an alcoholic out of the manager and then replaces him. This is the reward we get for being one of the good sports. Nothing. But we try our best to be like everybody else, and our only reward is that we are just like them. <laughs> and uh, what happens to them, we find out when we read the morning paper. So philosophy says, think this through. Use common sense, think all these things through. Philosophy gives you the power to sit down and think things through. And when you do this, you're not going to say philosophy is a burden on the spirit. You're not going to say it keeps me from doing the things I want to do. Rather, we are going to suddenly realize that it is a very delightful and helpful friend, someone who really has our good at heart, because wisdom has the good of all things at heart, and at mind also, and that all it's doing is asking us not to do the things which create the great need, the misery, the sorrow with which otherwise we will be suddenly faced as a result of a careless attitude toward life. So I think that in this sense, philosophy can help us now, not as a system of jarring beliefs that will never be reconciled, but as a, an approach to life, an organized thoughtfulness by which we think all things through, weigh all things with the faculties that have been given to us, and cling joyously but firmly to that which is good, in so doing, relieving ourselves of most of the disasters uh, which might normally make our lives miserable. If we can get some of this thinking done, I think it will help us in this time, in this critical time, to face living. Well, it's also a critical time to go home, so I can stop. And we'll see you next week.